from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, the last paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount, as we usually know it. That is Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, the two foundations. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Amen and thanks be to God. Foundations. There can be no doubt whatsoever that that is what Jesus is speaking of here. Foundations, the foundation of life of which there is only one, which foundation he is. In a sense, you see, Jesus is summing up all his teaching in this Sermon on the Mount. And if you can understand it, in another sense, Jesus is summing up all his teaching with a word here concerning its application, a word about foundations. Do you remember we began these studies looking at the way Gandhi admired the sermon and Tolstoy tried to apply it with legal literalism? Well, here at the end, both of these wrong approaches are swept aside and shown to be wrong and ultimately foolish. Here the choice and the choices which are present Throughout the sermon, yes, from the very beginning, chapter 5, verse 3, the Beatitudes. Hear these choices come sharply into focus. That focus is sustained from verse 13 onwards. Enter by the narrow gate, Jesus begins his closing section And he is speaking from there on about choices. He is taking all that he has said and all that he teaches and he's pressing it home, relentlessly, inescapably applying it so that we must choose. Choose, Jesus says, what you will do about my words And choosing to do nothing is still to choose. Choose your foundation. Choose whether you will build for eternity or for destruction. Now you'll notice that once again the choice is simplified to become the choice of one alternative only. I shouldn't say simplified because ultimately it is simple. There is one gate only that Christ would have us go through. One way only he would have us travel. One company only he would have us keep. And one destiny destiny only he would have us enter into. There are only two builders in this parable. It is a parable. And we, each one of us, must be one of them. And we can only be one or the other. There is no middle way. However much we would long for there to be and try to go two ways, we cannot and there is not. There is one way only. 
and there is no middle path between them. We can't have it both ways. We cannot build both ways. We must have one foundation or the other. Now there is a contrast, a further contrast here. It's a contrast between hearing and doing on the one hand. It's never a contrast between hearing and doing. But it's a contrast between hearing and doing on the one hand and hearing and doing nothing on the other. Now the contrast is meant to be understood in the light of the similarities. Now that's the disturbing thing about this. And maybe I'd better explain that. If you look at these words of Jesus, then to all appearances on your first reading, on a superficial understanding, there are no differences at all between the builders and what they build. Jesus deliberately does not distinguish between them. He does not say they are different in any way. He does not say they do anything different in any way. The difference between them is totally invisible and is not seen until what they built is tested by the storm. Both are builders both do build. Both build houses. Both build at the same time the parable suggests building in the good dry season. But the difference is not in the walls or the windows or the roof or the chimney or anything else. The difference according to Jesus is only in that which is not seen in the foundation. And only the storm could make apparent what was not apparent. Only the storm made visible what was invisible. It was the unseen foundation alone that made the life and death difference. It is as simple as that. Now, all human beings are builders. We are all seekers and we are all Builders, the Sermon on the Mount tells us. We live to build. Everything we learn, everything we do, everything we experience in life is built into the person we become as we go on. Whatever that be, and whatever we make of life, we are building as long as we are living. Some people build on achievement, some build with their creativity, some build with their intellectual ability, some build with the skills of their hands and minds, some build in terms of relationships and family. We all mix these things together, but we all build. To live as a human being is to build a life and to build a character. But the whole process and the whole substance never has its never has its, its material in the things of life. It's not found, the substance is not found in our achievements or our possessions. The substance of our building is in what we are. Now essentially what we are is what we are spiritually. Jesus is now facing that question of the essence of what we are or are not. He is indicating that to build there is only one foundation that will last. There is only one foundational rock which is himself and his word. And we'll come to that in a moment. But in terms of his word, there were and there still are builders who look alike. They seem to be building the same thing, but they are totally different. They are different only in that one has no foundation whatsoever. He has no rock underneath what is being built. 
And again, only the storm will show which is which. The same goes for the two kinds of hearers of Jesus' words. Now here there is a strong connection with the previous verses. You know, those who come to the Lord saying to him on the last day, Lord, Lord, we did this and that and the other in your name. We did all these mighty works. But Jesus never knew them. There are also, says Jesus here, two kinds of hearers. They look the same. They both, Jesus says, hear these words of mine. They may be people who read their Bible, who listen to faithful preaching. They may be people who go on to read Christian books. Their houses, in that sense, what they are building, appear to be the same. They are both builders. Perhaps even they both make room in their lives for Christian things. They may well both attend church faithfully, have Christian friends, may even be involved in Christian activities. Lord, we did this and the other in your name. But they are not building upon a sure foundation. The difference will be seen, says Jesus, when the storm comes, because the difference is in the foundation. One just began to build, but never dug down to foundational rock. The other did the unseen and unspectacular yet essential thing first. The other dug down through the rubble and the rubbish until he hit the rock, the bedrock which God has supplied. Now, I say that because, you know, if you were to turn to Luke's account of this teaching of Jesus, Luke includes the words that he dug deep. Luke 6 and 48 it is. The one with the foundation dug deep. Now, what exactly does this mean? Can we be clear about this? Can we be sure today about what Jesus is saying? Well, yes, we most definitely can be sure. God is described in His Word as our rock. We sang of it in our opening psalm this morning. But over and over again, not only in the psalms, but in Isaiah and into the New Testament, God is described as the rock of His people. And Christ is described, both promised in the Old Testament and realized in the New, described as the rock of God, the foundational stone, the cornerstone, the rock. He describes himself as the rock, because it's not Peter he is speaking to when he says, you are Peter and on this rock will I build this church. He is saying to him, surely, you are Peter, but on this rock I will build my church. Because doesn't 1 Corinthians tell us that there is no other foundation which can be laid than that which God has laid, which is Jesus Christ? Oh yes, you can be sure what the rock is. These words of mine, the teaching of Christ and Christ himself in his teaching, that is the rock and the only foundation of life. And you know, there are times when we do need to dig down to the rock. Before we begin the work of building our Christian lives, we need to get down to fundamentals. We need to find the foundation of our forgiveness and peace with God through Jesus Christ. But digging deep is not a very popular pastime. It's not popular because it's not visible, because it's not seen, because it's not spectacular, because nobody goes, wow, what a Christian that is. I started my ministry here amongst you speaking about two things and promised to hold to them. One was this centrality of the cross. And the other was taken from Nehemiah chapter 6 and it was to do with the foundation of the bedrock of Zion which is Jesus Christ. Do you remember Nehemiah chapter 6? We all need to do that though. 
not just together but individually we need to go down until we are sure we are building our Christian lives up on the rock of Christ and what he has done for us digging down is essential searching this scripture our hours of prayer our calling upon the name of God and asking for the assurance that our repentance and faith in Christ is true and real ask and it will be given you this is digging deep not blithely and lightly assuming that my feelings are evidence of a real repentance that because I feel it I really have faith in Christ the trouble with feelings the trouble with our feelings is that they change that they come and they go and they waver Digging deep is not being satisfied with being like other Christians or doing what they do or going where they go or conforming to their expectations of me. But of seeking God and His expectations and only being satisfied when I know I am in His will, whatever it be. Digging foundations is not just listening to the pastor appealing or even begging for hearers to repent and believe, but responding to the call to repentance and faith. Digging deep is not just hearing the word of God in Christ, but doing it, responding to it. Now Christ means us to be sure of our foundation. Are you? Am I sure of my foundation? I tell you this much, in all honesty, I am often not very sure about what I'm building and what I'm making of the Christian life. But I thank God that I am, because I can be, sure of my foundation because I am sure of my Savior. I'm not sure that every windy is going to hold once the storm comes at the end in what I'm building. But I'm sure of my foundation. God means us to be sure. God means us to clear away the old rubble of past sin, to be rid of disobedience and that which comes between us and Him. And He means us to build on the rock of Christ. The question that faces us in the Sermon on the Mount is not just have I heard but have I done what Jesus is saying I must do? Am I building upon a sure foundation? Whether you and I have or have not will become clear in the storm. Not just the storms of this life but the storms of what Jesus calls in verse 22 that day the last day when all will appear before him now there are storms in this life that also show what our foundation is like there are storms that come before the last day that reveal many truths about us where have you and I stood when there's been a storm of temptation when opportunity and temptation have come together and we've known what is right but tempted to be doing what is wrong have you ever said before God I just couldn't help it you know that's true there are times when we can't help it but with Christ we could have avoided it with Christ who overcame every temptation for us we can't say we can't help it if we have him and if His Holy Spirit lives in our hearts and in our Christian lives, then we can overcome in His victory. We can know victory. And I'm not saying it's not hard, because it is. It's still hard. And those who don't give in at the first temptation know better than those who do how hard it can be. C.S. Lewis speaks about those who know the strength of the wind are not those who fall down flat as soon as it blows, but those who lean forward and step on. 
Storms of temptation can reveal our foundation. So can storms of tribulation. Do you use the words, I just can't cope. I just can't bear this. I can't go on. And there can be times when it's true, you just can't go on. You just cannot face any more. But with Christ who faced it all for us, and faces it with us, we can, you know. Those who have gone on with Christ in the face of daunting circumstances have lived to be surprised, not so much at themselves, but at what Christ can do in themselves. And again, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that with Christ it all becomes plain sailing. That is just not a true testimony and it's not what the Bible teaches. It can be hard. It can be heart-wearying. There can be times when it's sore and we feel scarred and wounded. And yet, and yet, because of Him and because He and His Word is our foundation, such weak people as I and you are, I am and you are, can become anvils upon which many hammers will break. People who teach that Christians, because they are Christians, don't have to face storms, are teaching nonsense. They are not teaching what the Bible teaches. Jesus warned us about tribulation. The Bible over and over again does. And there's not a single book in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that doesn't speak of trouble. You can face the storms of temptation and tribulation. There are others. There are the storms of loss and grief and pain, bereavement, loneliness, betrayal. There are the storms that come because of personal weaknesses. But whatever the rain and the flood and the winds should be, with Christ as our foundation, we shall stand. And having done all, stand. Not because of what we are, but because of what Christ is. Sometimes, you know, it all comes at once. In fact, that's the way Jesus describes it. The wind and the rain and the floods rising all at once. So that we feel there's just no possible way to go on. But the storms will test our building. And they reveal what kind of foundation we have. without Christ as foundation whatever we survive in this life in the end it will be lost do you see that once again the essential thing is our relationship to Christ having him as foundational to our lives is knowing him loving him obeying him Our relationship to Christ is what matters. Now people may look the same. And their lives may look the same. They may sound the same. Lord, Lord, did we not? Jesus' words here apply to those who do show some interest in him and in his way. Jesus is not speaking here of the dogs and pigs of verse 6 who openly despise him and his word. He's speaking about those who do try to build something. But he is speaking of those whose foundation is just not there. Their deep and invisible foundation is not there. Because they do not have that relationship with him which is foundational to life. Some people have a little of storm in their lives and others have a lot. 
And those who have to face the storm, you know, are sometimes thought to be less faithful and true to Christ by others. There are those who see in the storms of life that a Christian faces judgment of God, temporal judgment on them, and that is so very often superficial and silly. If anything, you should always argue the other way. The Father chastises those whom he loves. The ones who go through life smoothly or relatively smoothly have a tendency to ask if God is judging when another Christian goes through suffering. Or if perhaps the suffering Christian is less wise than they have been. But isn't wisdom revealed in the storm? The wisdom that has found the foundation in Christ. If your house stands through a calm summer, it proves nothing. But if it stands through the winter storms, there must be something there that you can't see. But you need above all things a foundation, a living relationship to Christ and obedience to his word. It can be very hard, but you know, we can learn like Paul to thank God for the storms of life. Now, let me say this finally. These verses and this teaching of Jesus must not be twisted in order to justify a false doctrine of salvation by works, by doing things. The opposite is Jesus' intention. He is making the houses sound exactly the same to point us away from what we do to the foundation upon which we are doing it. And there's one of the themes of the New Testament. Saying and doing. We are not saved by saying the right things about Jesus. Neither are we saved by saying the right things to Jesus. Lord, Lord. We are saved by Him. In the grace of God through faith. And foundational to it all is his cross and resurrection, what he has done. The disciples never forgot this. If we had time this morning, I'd show you in John from his epistle, epistles, from James, from Peter, from Paul too, that they never forgot this, that Christ himself is the foundation. What he has done for us, what he is, is our rock. But the call is to choose. To choose to do His will. To be what He wants us to be. And so Jesus ends on the same note which He has sounded throughout the sermon. The note of radical choice. Christ will have his people different. Salt and light. He has spoken of a different kind of integrity of heart, of different values, different goals, our treasure in heaven. He has spoken of different in our lives, a real life of prayer and worship. He has spoken of different ways and different destinations. The Sermon on the Mount presents us with the alternatives. The real alternative to conformity to the world. You know, even the world's radicals are the world's radicals. They conform. But we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We are to be different. There are two doors, two ways, two companies, two masters, 
two destinations, two foundations. There's Christ the Lord or the sand of self and nothing. Every one of us is building. But on what? On what are you building? Jesus says, Build on me. Let's sing of this. It's the hymn number 697. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 697.